You can't be quiet because someone who sits in the office of prophethood cannot remain silent in the face of injustice. Allah is the one who will preserve his deen. But is it going to be my children, your children? This is where our discussion should be. The soul is coming from heaven. And because it's coming from above, it has to be nurtured from the exact same source, spiritual source. Why our young brothers and sisters are leaving faith? It's because they live a life of false expectations. We are a group that believes in the good, the common good of society. They want to extinguish the light of Allah, but your Lord has refused, except that his light shall prevail. Muslims, always be on the side of the truth. Our young people end up saturated with secularizing, atheizing thoughts and epistemology. We need to create a space where we can listen to them. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ثم أما بعد. The Lord reward Brother Abdullah for the introduction actually for that topic that we were discussing about the subject of yaqeen, the subject of certainty to a matter that is very crucial, very important, such as the subject of atheism that is now sweeping into the world, including into the Muslim community. As an imam, as a community leader, I've seen it and I've seen a lot of it. In the recent time, there are so many parents are calling and telling me, hey, I have my two young daughters, for example, or I have one daughter, she's a teenager, or she's now went to college. My son, he's a such and such you know, age, and he went to college, and now they're doubting Islam. She wants to remove her hijab. They have doubts about this issue, and so they keep wondering what's going on. What is the reason why our children leaving Islam or doubting Islam to end up becoming agnostics or atheists. What's the reason? What is the main secret behind it? How should we even rationalize that if it's even possible to rationalize? And is it even possible for religious people to have such a doubt like Brother Ubaidullah was talking about with Imam al-Ghazali rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi? The answer is yes. You see, even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us against this. The brothers and the sisters who are active in the da'wah field they probably, they know that more than anybody else. There is something on this path to Allah Azza wa Jal known as the moment. That moment is when each and every one of us after so long on this path, they come to this moment of examination. A moment where they wanna know, they wanna make sure that all this life wasn't for nothing. That is a moment they go through. Rasulullah informed us that we might get that moment, all of us. Says a shaitan, the Prophet is saying, A shaitan yati ahadakum. Shaitan will come to one of you and he start asking you these questions. Man khalaqa kada? Who created this? And then he would say, Allah, in your mind as a believer. And he would say, Man khalaqa kada? Who, who created this then? He would say, Allah. And you start coming from something small to something great, and then you come to the end after asking yourself too many questions of who created this, who created this, who created that. Then you come to the ultimate question. But hold on a second. Then uh, who created Allah? That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. It's a question that might come to our mind and our heart. And for those who don't have strong iman and faith that transcend the subject of rationality, in this case, we will not have that taste of Iman and we will suffer. So the Prophet ﷺ said, when the shaitan comes to you to this moment, Let this person say, You seek refuge with Allah from the shaitan and then quit. Because it doesn't matter how much you try, our mind is not infinite. We're a finite being, we were born with an expiration date for a reason. Because you use that exact time that you have in order to find that purpose, and if it's possible. So that moment of clarity comes to each and every one of us. We want to know why and how. Ulama had these actual moments and was written in their books as well. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi ta'ala he used to say that he would read the, the, the uh, hundred tafsir, maybe exaggeration, but eventually he says, he would read in the ayah 
a hundred tafsir try to understand, but then he still does not get it. Still have doubt in the meaning, the exact meaning of it. So he takes himself out there in public to humble himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, humiliating himself to Allah azza wa jal in that sense, which means, as the title to this topic, to surrender to Allah azza wa jal. And he puts his cheek on the dust and he asks Allah azza wa jal, Qala ya, ya mu'allima Dawood allimni, wa ya mufahima Sulaiman fahimni. Ya mu'allima Dawood, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, that he gave the knowledge to Dawood, but he gave the understanding to his son Sulaiman. So he's asking Allah, Ya Allah, the one who gave knowledge to Dawood, give me that knowledge of this ayah. Ya Allah, the one who gave the understanding of this to, to Sulaiman, give me the understanding of this ayah. So having those doubts, I want you to understand it's their natural. But they're natural for us as human beings to have that doubt so that we start really exploring our faith, our iman, to get to that moment of yaqeen. Obviously, those who have more knowledge, those who practice that knowledge, their yaqeen is higher than others. So chances for them to go through these moments frequently much less than those who don't. So what happens to our young children, young brothers and sisters today, when they go through these moments on their own and they don't have the solid foundation of the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal, why do they turn away from faith and what happens if they decide to quit faith and what, what happens if they start to say that there is no more God? You see, in essence, when people want to say, I don't believe in God, what they're trying to do is two simple things. Number one, they're trying to take control of their own lives because that thought of the uncertainty is actually killing them. So they want to just take control back into their hands. So they quit believing and they say, you know what, that's it. I don't believe in God. And the second thing that they do, they want to cut ties. They want to cut ties with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that relationship, it seems that it's actually provided them with less purpose and reason or put boundaries on them. Obviously, that's what the thought they have in their mind. I want to explain these two things to you, inshallah wa ta'ala. So the, for the first thing when we're talking about right now, as human beings, Allah Azza wa Jal created us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us from two components, earthly components and heavenly components. The earthly components is that rational components of the land, of the earth. So when you get hungry, you need to sustain this body from the exact ingredients from which it was created, from earth. So if you're gonna eat, if you're gonna sustain your body, what do you do? You eat, you drink, you exercise, you take care of it so you can have a healthy body. But then the other part is the soul. And the soul is coming from heaven. According to Hayat ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda, Rasulullah sallallahu mentioned when the baby in the wombs for 40 days and 40 days and then 40 days, that's 120 days, then the angel will be sent down with the ruh. And the angel will breathe that ruh in the wombs. So that baby becomes alive and four things will be written. So that ruh is coming from above. And because it's coming from above, it has to be nurtured from the exact same source, spiritual source. That source is not from earth. And you have to feed it from that which is also spiritual. This is where the fitrah, that pre-installed software we have in our hearts, will work in order for us to understand the relationship between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of people have a problem with that. So what do they do? They try to feed the spiritual part from earthly components. They're looking for some earthly human knowledge. They're looking for some earthly human knowledge that will help them sustain that understanding of their spiritual part. It wouldn't work because it's not from there. Doesn't matter how much you try to rationalize that, it goes back to the fitrah. Like Brother Fahad Taslim was talking about the super, the super active rationale which means above the rational matter. That is the first principle. The thing that you look into it and you realize, okay, so that's something you feel. Something you feel. You know when you go to Hajj and people come back from Hajj, you ask them, how was Hajj? They say, subhanAllah, I can't describe it with words. You have to be there. What does that exactly mean? Like I can't, I can't make sense of the feeling that I'm getting from being in Hajj. It doesn't make any sense. It's just something you have to experience. Faith is the same thing too. Rasulullah mentioned the hadith Anas radiallahu ta'ala an that thalathun man kunna fihi wajad bihinna halawat al-iman three things if you observe them if you acquire them you will savor the sweetness of faith so it's something that you taste 
something that you, you don't actually, you, you feel it in that way. And these are the things that we need to learn about, inshallah, but first of all, when it comes to atheism, is it something new? That all of a sudden we woke up in the 21st century, suddenly people start stopping believing in Allah Azza wa Jal? Of course not. It's way back then in the history of mankind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recorded that in the Quran as well. He spoke about disbelievers some way before. What did they say? When they talked about themselves and their life, they say, In hiya illa hayatun dunya wa ma nahnu mab'uthin. He said, This is just the life of this world. And there'd be no resurrection after that. وَقَالُوا مَا هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ He said, it's only this life, this life of this world, we will, we will die, we will live in this world, and that's it. وَمَا يَهْلِكُنَا إِلَّا الدَّهَرُ We only die because of time, which means we age, we die, and that's it. So they said that before. You remember the man who came to the Prophet wasallam, And he had in his hand some old bones, and he crushed them, and he... Blew the dust in the face of the Prophet sallallahu and he said to Muhammad sallallahu wasallam, "Ya Muhammad, tell me now, do you think that God is going to bring this back again, put it together?" And the Prophet sallallahu said, "Indeed, He will do that, and He'll put you in Jahannam." So this man, still doubting that, but when you doubt, what happens? In the recent, in the modern time, as a matter of fact, in the late 1800s. That's when European philosophers started introducing or reintroducing Greek philosophy and modern terminologies to the world. And that's when all of a sudden, some of these philosophers came with the notion, the idea, there is no God. And they said it boldly, actually, they say, God is dead, a'udhu billah. Such a heinous word comes out of their mouths when they claim that God is dead. But what happened? when they claim that God was dead. If you look at what happens around us in the world in terms of the mental health of the people, their serenity, the level of you know, a peace and tranquility in their lives, it's all gone. When people realize there is no God, all of a sudden, now they lack purpose. What's the meaning of this life? Suddenly, meaningless, actually not having any meaning in, for life has become purpose for them, which means just play, play in this life and live the way you can. No boundary whatsoever. If you try to put any regulations, that doesn't make any sense. Because there is no account. So why you limit yourself? And as a result, people they start doing all what you consider immoral because there is no account. The only account that they try to create, and subhan, this is the irony. They realize when they killed God, basically in their own minds, now they unleash the evil of human beings. So they had to restrict them. So they had to create a man-made law in order to make these people abide by what they call a social contract. And they say that religion puts restrictions, but it's okay for liberal values to put restriction as well. Because that's now again goes back to materialism. But the religion comes from spiritual actually background. So they, when they said that, a lot of people start living that life of selfishness. It's all about me. Who cares? Family values died. The concept of morality died. Even sexuality went beyond control. All of this level of suicide increased. Why? Because people realize if I'm going to live and die and there is no meaning to my life, why bother? Let me make it short. And the rate of the suicides are increasing actually. Wars. Invading other nations and considering people to be inferior because we believe in the evolution, basically. And these human beings are less than human than us. And subhanAllah, just like was a ravage wars in the, in the 1800s and the, the beginning of the century and before that. So eventually, people with not, not believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they lose control. But why is it today, at least for us in the Muslim community, why our young brothers and sisters are leaving faith. We know that in Europe, when they start leaving faith, obviously it has a lot to do with Christianity as it was presented to them, and the church and its power over the people during the feudal system, and there was the economic inequality. So all of this led the people to completely abandon the church because it doesn't actually believe in science and so on. For Muslims, we don't have these problems. So why is it that the young men and women today are leaving Islam? And I've looked into it. I asked a lot of these young men and women, subhanAllah. They gave me their own reasons. And I realized that a lot to do had to do with the image of Islam and Muslims today. 
You know, those who grew up in the 1980s and 90s, like myself, that was a time when we used to call it a sahwa which means the awakening of the Muslim community. People that start coming back to Islam and to Allah Azza wa Jal in, in hundreds and thousands, mashallah. Massages were filled with young men and women, and there was hope that things are moving, alhamdulillah, in the right direction for the Muslim community. That didn't last long, though, because that's the sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah will shake the people to see who's true and who's not. But back then, it was easy for people to be Muslim. It was easy for them to be proud of being Muslims. Why? Because at the time, it was cool to be Muslim. Because of being, of being a Muslim, that means you're good. You're a man of, you know, of your word. You're a person who holds yourself to a higher standard of character. You're very generous. You sacrifice, you this, you that. Values everybody admired during that time. Today, if you look at this, the image of Muslim and Muslims, even in the Muslim land, even in the heart of the Muslim land today, it's an image that everybody's trying to fight. So it's no longer a cool thing to be Muslim anymore. Our kids are battling this. They don't know how to identify themselves as Muslims without being ascribed to all this negativity that they see on TV and their friends see on TV as well. So they start having doubts. At such a very young age, they start having doubt. But this doubt coming from what? Which is, I believe, the core of the loss of faith in this younger generation. It is actually cutting their ties with Allah Azza wa Jal. I've been studying relationships for so long, for 15 years, doing counseling on different levels, family, husband and wife, parents and their kids, and even coaching people who have crises of, you know, with faith and so forth. I realized that one thing, one common factor in all these issues, the number one reason for why people actually cutting ties with people around them and with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's because they live a life of false expectations. It's all about expectation. I'm going to explain this to you. As a young Muslim, you grow up in a household that keeps telling you Islam is deen of, you know, if the religion of peace, religion of equality, mashallah, inclusivity, and this and that. And all what they see is the opposite. They see it at home. They see how their parents treat them, how we treat other people, how we speak about people of other, you know, faith and race and so on. It starts creating doubt for them. The expectation from being Muslims is now being tarnished by all these things, so they start having doubt. And as a result, they turn to Allah Azza wa Jal for help. So they are at one level, expecting to be at certain level with Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal does not favor anybody, a jama'ah. That's a test, that's a trial. You're gonna to have to work hard until you build your yaqeen. Like Brother Ubaidullah, he mentioned it very clearly. You wanna have faith, you wanna have certainty, you need to work on it. But my faith is so weak that I can't even start the process. Well, that's what you need to do. You need to force yourself to start worshiping until you build your strong iman to get you to that level. But how can I do this if I'm not at that level to begin with? Well, that's what you need to have actually some support and start working on this. So here we have, we start at this level, expect to be at this level, when we cannot get there, and we keep looking first time, and second time, and third time, we get disappointed the first time, second time, third time, fifth time, and then what happens? These young boys and young ladies actually, they start getting angry and upset. Every time they have hope that the Muslims, alhamdulillah, are doing something good, something else happens. They get upset, and they start wondering, one disappointment after another disappointment after another disappointment, they start getting angry because their expectation is not met. Anger is never a problem. That's the first thing I see from the young men and women when it comes to the subject of loss of faith. It's a red flag. It's never the problem. So when you deal with your child, with your daughter, and they bring you this emotional crisis they're going through, please don't brush them off. Please. Don't say, come on, this child is stuff. Don't, don't think like that way. Don't do this. A'udhu billah, astaghfirullah. Don't do this. Don't brush it off. Open up with them. Let them express their feelings. You might get offended by some words that they say. Take it easy on them. They're just upset. They're angry. Something is going on in their mind and their hearts that is leading them away from Allah Azza wa Jal. You need to embrace them and see what's going on. So the anger part that you see from your children is only the red flag. It's not the problem. So what is the problem? 
The problem is not up here. That's where anger is. The problem is all the way down there, what we call uncertainty. Our kids, they have this crisis now. They see their friends, they see people of other faiths and how they treat other people, how they help each other, how this and that and so on. So in the Muslim community, we keep preaching so good stuff, but we don't see much of it in, in, in action, really. It brings that doubt and that uncertainty in their lives. The uncertainty about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases in their minds and their hearts. Some of them are huffad. But then they wonder, okay, I finished the Quran, then what? What's the point? How is that supposed to help me? They don't see their faith increasing at all. It's actually drifting. And that's this wondering so much. So that leads to an anxiety. If a human brain hates anything it hates, actually, it hates uncertainty. So it develops an anxiety because it's a matter of self-defense mechanism. You need to remove that uncertainty. How? By getting ready for it, whether you fight or flight. So an anxiety starts increasing in the mind and the heart, and the human brain is, is actually automatically adjust itself to circumstances. So when it's a threat, it goes the way up. When the threat is gone, it goes the way down. So it's keep regulating itself. These thoughts and these emotional feelings we have about faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on, the problem with them, they're not like physical threat. Like if there is a dog chasing you and then you close the door, you feel safe, your threat level goes down. But with the faith issue, there is no door to close. So the mind keeps worrying and worrying and worrying because and, it doesn't know what to do. Should I regulate safety or threat to what level? It continues until we hit level three. Level three is fear. So you go from uncertainty to an anxiety to fear. Fear of what? That is the problem. Fear of the unknown. I don't even know what I'm afraid of. Is there Jahannam? Is it true about Jannah? I don't know, there's Hisab. So they keep wondering. And their minds are expanding. What if I quit? And they're so scared to say that I don't want to believe, but at the same time, they don't see themselves strong enough to become believers. So they keep worrying, and they keep thinking, and their mind is expanding with all these, with all these awful thoughts in their minds and their hearts. What if, and keep increasing and increasing until they reach a moment where they cannot battle this anymore. When they can't battle this anymore, would increase also emotional pressure from their families, friends, culture, society, whatever. All of that, they come to a crashing moment. They become numb. Once they become numb, they move to phase four, resentment. When they get into resentment, that's a self-defense mechanism. This is survival mode. You build your guards all the way up to protect yourself against the elements. They cut themselves away from people. They don't want to discuss things. They want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about this issue. No, I'm not interested. That's fine. I don't want to, talk. I don't want to meet the imam. I don't want to talk to the sheikh. They want to cut themselves completely to protect themselves because they want to save their energy. And that goes into feeling burned out, to feeling that chronic resentment, and they don't want to be kind anymore. And finally, it leads to depression. When people got to get to that moment, that's when anger becomes the manifestation of the situation. So what's the solution? The solution, they want to remove the uncertainty. So they try communication. They come to their parents. They come to the imam. They come to the leaders. They go online. They try to communicate. And we were unable to relate to them when the communication doesn't work because communication always happens, but the connection is missing. So when the connection is missing and it's not working, what do people usually do to protect themselves and remove these uncertainties? They move to level two. Level two is control. People want to take control in their hands right now. So one of the ways these young men and women, when they become a certain age and realize I'm an adult now, no one can say anything to me, what do they do? They take control in their hands and they cut ties with Allah completely. And they announce themselves to be agnostics, atheists, I don't believe in God, this and that, and so on. Obviously, in the Muslim community, it's different degrees and different levels. Some people, they completely remove themselves from Islam, and they probably, which is a very, very small percentage, that might actually move to a different faith. Other groups, they don't. They just become agnostics, somewhere in between. I believe in superpower, I believe in God, but I don't know who he is. I'm not sure about what you guys are talking about. Other people, they become completely atheists. Other people, less than that. 
they believe in Islam, but they want to make everybody equal. So God of Islam and none of the Muslims, they're all the same thing too. Just have faith in general. So they go through all these things because now they're trying to take control of the idea of believing in God and one God only. And you cannot reconcile between what they've been taught and what they've been going through. The knowledge is not there, so they try to take control. Same thing between husband and wife when the communication doesn't work. They want to take control of their personal lives, so they ask for divorce. And that's when people ask divorce to divorce the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do that as a means to protect ourselves and guard ourselves. This is how we should understand the relationship of our children with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with us parents, mentors, imams, and so on. There is so much uncertainty going and circling around in the life of these young men and women. So much uncertainty. And that uncertainty is bothering them, is killing them from the inside out. And they don't have answers. Probably because parents, they don't take it seriously. Parents are just making them busy doing things that are not related to their faith. Like what? Forget about these things. Focus on your studies. Just do your homework. What does it matter? Just do your salah. And we're not trying to rationalize or emotionalize their experience for them. We're not making the subject of faith something personal to them that they need to taste and they need to live. It's not about memorizing certain lists of arkan al-Iman, arkan al-Islam. It's not that. It's living it. How much of this are we living it? Are we sharing it with our children? Our children go through these things and unfortunately they will continue to go through these things as we see the fastest growing religion, unfortunately, is actually the no religion. Many, many people are losing faith. Even the Muslim community will have in this as well. And if we don't do anything about it, we will actually we will lose the battle. Allah is the one who, who, who will preserve his deen. But is it going to be my children, your children? This is where our, our discussion should be as Muslims. We need to bring this to our masajid, to our communities, to our Islamic schools, in the best way possible, but we have to understand what our kids are going through. One thing, a few, last thing, a few things I want to mention to you, inshallah ta'ala, is why do we have, why we do go through these things? When it comes to the subject of faith, like we said, even though we have the rational evidences, even though we have the arguments, we have the videos, we have all these things, but what we really lack is the personal touch with this, the emotional, spiritual aspect of this. And that's where our training should be for our imams, our youth mentors, our teachers in Islamic schools, this is where the focus needs to be. Not about giving them factual debates, like some parents, they send me emails, says, I'm going to bring you my 16-year-old son or daughter because I want you to talk to them about this issue to convince them. So I said, listen, it's not about convincing them. I think they know better than me and you. They're just having a hard time accepting. That is the problem. And we need to know how to connect with them, not just how to talk to them how to connect with them, and this is where it's very important. One thing I've noticed uh, among many of these young men and women when it comes to the subject of losing faith, really, is that they have lost their fitra. The fitra, the natural innate, that's really the pre-installed software that Allah has given us in our hearts to believe in Allah Azza wa Jal, has been covered with so much of this dunya. A lot of parents, they're just focusing on providing for their families with material, material stuff. So our kids, they grow up with alhamdulillah with so much dunya, so much dunya, that they start losing motive, losing purpose. And as a result, their fitrah is completely covered. They don't see any purpose anymore in their lives. We need to understand why from our children as well. And one thing I've noticed would be a very, very healthy experience is to take our kids outdoors to go and observe the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, when Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran in many, many ayat, speaking to our hearts, not just to our minds, speaking to our fitrah, He says, قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Go and walk through the earth. Observe. Allah is asking us to observe the mountains, the rain, the valleys, the plains, the oceans, the people, the colors, the languages. Observe all of that. To register what? To register in our fitrah, not just in our mind. Living materialistic world has completely blocked us from seeing Allah's creation firsthand. When was the last time 
when was the last time you went outside and you saw the clear, the clear dome of the sky at night, naturally? When was the last time you saw these, uh, these stars? When was the last time you watched the sunset? Some people, they say, yeah, I did actually watch, last, watch yesterday. I was watching it on YouTube. All these beautiful natural phenomena are watching them through the internet. We're no longer connected with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No wonder our hearts are exhausted. No wonder our fitras is so exhausted because it's never been nurtured enough. We've been nurturing our bodies so long, trying to rationalize things, you know, with our mind, but we were never able to connect with our spirit, our soul, of course, through observation of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and protect our children, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Give us the ability to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala easily. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unify our hearts with Him, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to revive our fitra for us and for our children, to protect us from ilhad, protect us from atheism in this dunya. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring our kids back to Allah azza wa jal, to bring them to God their hearts, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala ali wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You can't be quiet because someone who sits in the office of prophethood cannot remain silent in the face of injustice. Allah is the one who will preserve his deen. But is it going to be my children, your children? This is where our discussion should be. The soul is coming from heaven. And because it's coming from above, it has to be nurtured from the exact same source, spiritual source. Why our young brothers and sisters are leaving faith? It's because they live a life of false expectations. We are a group that believes in the good, the common good of society. They want to extinguish the light of Allah, but your Lord has refused, except that His light shall prevail. Muslims, always be on the side of the truth. Our young people end up saturated with secularizing, atheizing thoughts and epistemology. We need to create a space where we can listen to them.